Hi y'all. Today we're going to be talking about properties of matter. We're going to be talking about physical properties and chemical properties, intrinsic versus extrinsic properties, um, physical and chemical changes, and we're also going to discuss the law of conservation of matter. So have your notes ready, something to write with, a nice quiet place to listen, and let's go. So when we're talking about matter, first let's talk about physical properties. Oftentimes these are the ones that are easiest for us to conceptualize and understand. A physical property is a quality or a condition of a substance that can be observed or measured without changing a substance's composition. This means you don't have to do anything to the substance generally to be able to observe that property. They're generally considered to be two types of physical properties, intensive and extensive. And we're going to talk about both. First, intensive physical properties are properties that depend upon the type of matter in the sample, not the amount of matter in the sample. Once again, it depends on the type of matter in the sample, not the amount of matter in the sample. So let's look at some examples of intensive physical properties. Some intensive physical properties might include state of matter, color, taste, freezing point, boiling point, odor, solubility or lack thereof, luster, which is really fancy way of saying shine, brittleness, malleability, conductivity. These are all examples of intensive physical properties. Basically, intensive physical properties won't change whether you have a small amount of matter or a large amount of matter. Having a very small amount of matter might make it more difficult to observe these intensive physical properties, but they do not change them. For example, if I wanted to smell uh, a sample of sulfur, um, if I have a larger sample, obviously I'm going to smell that more as opposed to if I had a very small sample. State, for example, water. Water can, you have commonly encountered water in both the solid, the liquid, and the gaseous state. They're all water. You can observe them and tell what state a substance is in. Freezing point. Freezing point of water doesn't change whether we have a small amount or a large amount of water. Same for boiling point. Solubility. Now, here's where people get a little confused. There are limits to the solubility of a substance, meaning you can only dissolve a certain amount of a substance in water before it becomes what we call saturated, and no more will dissolve. However, that depends not on the amount of the substance, but on the ratio of the solute, the thing you're trying to dissolve, to the solvent, the thing you're trying to do the dissolving in. For example, salt or table salt sodium chloride in water. There's a limit to how much sodium chloride you can dissolve in a given sample of water. But if you increase both of those substances proportionally to one another, you can dissolve any amount of, so of sodium chloride given you have a large enough amount of water. Luster or shine, that's not going to change. If I have a small amount of gold, it's just as shiny as a large amount of gold. Brittleness. If I have a small piece of clay, it's just as brittle as a large piece of clay. And conductivity, a small length of wire, is just as conductive as a longer length. Specifically, if we're talking about something like copper. Extensive physical properties, on the other hand, have to do with the amount of matter in your sample. So if we are talking about matter, what is the definition we've had that relates back to the amount of matter in a sample? Well, that would be mass. This is a property that depends on the amount of mass in your sample. For example, mass is an extensive physical property, so is volume. So would length be an intensive or an extensive property? 
a length would be an extensive property. It depends on the amount of matter in your sample. But what about density? Would density be an intensive or an extensive property? Well, density would be an intensive property because it's always based on the ratio of mass to volume. That, even if you have a larger sample, your volume will also be larger, thus your density will not change because it's the proportion of mass to volume. If you look on table S of your reference table, you can see the density for all common elements at standard temperature and pressure. The density of substances can vary based on the temperature that they're at. Some things expand when they're heated, some things expand when they're cooled. However, because all of the values in table S are shown at standard temperature and pressure, which according to table A on your reference table is um, 0 degrees Celsius or 273 degrees Kelvin and one atmosphere, they're standardized across all our measurements. Let's talk a little bit about chemical properties. Chemical properties really are looking at the ability of a substance to undergo some specific chemical change, like oxidation, reduction, combustion. Um, these are all types of chemical changes. You might commonly have heard these referred to as things like burning, rotting, rusting, fermenting, decomposing, or exploding. We're burning something. We're really going through the chemical process of combustion. Rotting is really related to the chemical process of decomposition. Rusting is oxidation. This would be the same if it were a piece of iron, which rusts into iron oxide, or a piece of copper, which oxidizes into copper oxide. It's that green coating on the outside of a penny, or that sometimes forms on the Statue of Liberty. Fermentation is a process by which carbon dioxide and common organic alcohols are produced. And exploding, well, that's kind of a category all its own. So I'd like you to take a moment and let's try a practice problem. Think about an iron nail. I want you to think of three intensive physical properties that iron nail might have. One extensive physical property that iron nail might have, and one chemical property that an iron nail might have. Take a moment, think them over. So the intensive physical properties of an iron nail might include things like its luster, maybe it has a shine, it's its state. Well, if it's an iron nail, it better be a solid. Not going to be able to build a wall with that if it isn't. Um, things like its odor. Believe it or not, iron does have a distinct odor. Its freezing point. We don't usually think of solids as having a freezing point, but everything does. That iron, its freezing point, was far, far below standard temperature and pressure, and that's what allows it to be a solid while you're observing it. Conductivity is another great physical property you might have listed. Can an iron nail conduct electricity? Absolutely. Might not be as efficient as copper or gold, but it can definitely conduct. We can even think about solubility. Would an iron nail be soluble in water? Well, you better hope that it's not, or every time it rains, your roof would come apart. So those are some examples of intensive physical properties. What about extensive physical properties? Well, those would include things like the mass of the nail and the volume of the nail or its size. You could also think about it in terms of the length of the nail. Not all nails are made the same. One chemical property of the nail might include rusting or oxidation. That's the first one that comes to mind for me. You've all seen iron rust. We've discussed it a little bit in class when I showed you that jar of iron oxide the other day. So that would be considered a chemical property of an iron nail. So just like we have physical properties and chemical properties, 
we have physical changes and chemical changes. Physical changes are generally reversible or some can be irreversible. During a physical change, some properties of a material change, but the composition or the makeup of the material does not change. For example, when we boil water, it's still water. Freezing, same goes there. If you freeze something or change it from a liquid to a solid, it's still the original substance, just in a new phase. Melting, likewise, it's a phase change. Phase changes, by the way, are all physical. Breaking, if we take something and break it up, or grind it, or cut it, or crush it, we're not changing it into a new substance. We're just changing the way that it looks by breaking it into smaller pieces. Chemical changes, on the other hand, are very different from physical changes. During a chemical change, the composition of our matter always changes. One or more substances here are going to change into a new substance during a chemical reaction. Our substance that we have at the start is called our reactant, and our substance that we have at the end of this process is called a product. When we generally write this as a formula, we would think of it as our reactants yield, that's what the arrow means, our product. Now, it's kind of like a recipe. All your ingredients are your reactants. The thing you get at the end that you're going to eat, well, that would be your product. So how do we know when a chemical change has happened? Number one, there's usually some transfer of energy involved. Number two, oftentimes there might be a change in color of our substances. Three, there might be a gas formed or a gas released in the process. How do you know if you mix two liquids, how do you know if you're getting a gas? Any thoughts? That's pretty straightforward. You could look for bubbles. There's a precipitate form is our fourth thing we can look for. That's when you mix two liquids and a solid forms that then kind of precipitates out of the liquid or sinks down to the bottom of your reaction vessel. The whole thing doesn't usually turn solid, but one of the components of the new products you've made is an insoluble solid. So it's kind of like the snow in a snow globe. It'll just kind of settle out in our reaction vessel and form a layer, usually at the bottom of our test tube or flask. And the fifth thing that we're looking for is that there's some change in composition from the beginning to the end of our reaction. Once again, I do want to stress here, phase changes are physical changes. They are not chemical changes. So an example of this would be bubbles of carbon dioxide forming on limestone when you drop some acid on that limestone. This was a really common test that you did for limestone, probably back in earth science. If you saw that bubbling, that was a chemical reaction. Likewise, if you drop acid into milk, it will also curdle. For example, um, if you um, had some milk and you were wanting to turn it into cheese, the most common way to do that is to actually add lemon juice. And that causes the milk to curdle and the solids to separate from the liquids. You can't undo that. It's like when milk goes bad. You can't turn it back into fresh milk. It's the same principle. Milk goes bad because bacteria in the milk have started to produce acids in the milk itself, which then causes the proteins in the milk to separate from the fats in the milk. So to summarize, during a physical change, a substance changes some physical property. For example, if we have an iceberg, we have water, and it's still the same material whether that iceberg has started to evaporate or whether that iceberg has started to melt. Doesn't matter if it's a solid, a liquid, or a gas, it is still just water. Chemical properties, on the other hand, look at the tendency of a substance to change into another substance. So if we look, for example, going back to our example of iron, we have a steel beam that's mostly iron that rusting 
is caused by the iron reacting with oxygen in the atmosphere to produce iron oxide or rust. That would be a chemical property. That reaction formula is four irons react with three oxygens to produce two molecules of iron oxide. On the left are our reactants and on our right are the products. So we could also read this as iron and oxygen yield iron oxide. Chemical changes involve changes that are a rearrangement of atoms. There any change that involves a rearrangement of atoms. Physical changes, you might be changing the position of molecules or of atoms, but you're not rearranging them into something new. I like to use the example of Legos. If you have a box of Legos, remember, you can take them apart and make them into something new. If you did that, that would be equivalent to a chemical change. Chemical reactions are the process of a chemical change. And during a chemical reaction, new materials are formed by a change in the way those atoms are bonded together. You're either taking compounds and breaking them apart into their elements, or you might be taking elements and forming new compounds. You could also react a compound with another compound, switch their parts, and end up with two totally new compounds. These are all examples of chemical reactions. So some examples of physical properties, once again, would include things like boiling point, melting point, luster, volatility, which is how quickly something evaporates, color, taste, softness or hardness, slipperiness, odor, ductility, malleability, electrical conductivity, if something dissolves in water or is solubility, viscosity, meaning how resistant something is to flow, and density. Chemical properties would include things like something that burns in air, exploding, tarnishing, reacting with acids, or reacting with metals, or even reacting with water. Some compounds decompose when you heat them, and some react with certain nonmetals. Toxicity would also be considered a chemical property. Remember, chemical properties can only be observed during a chemical reaction. So the formation of a compound, remember, the formation of a compound is a chemical change. The formation of a mixture would be a physical change. Remember, mixtures, we are not chemically changing anything. We're just mixing two things together physically. So if we have calcium carbonate or limestone and we crush it, well, what would that be? A physical or a chemical change? That would definitely be a physical change. However, if we take that crushed limestone and we heat it and it goes through decomposition, releasing carbon dioxide gas, well, that would be what type of change? That would be a chemical change. We would be forming calcium oxide or lime and carbon dioxide. That would be a decomposition reaction and that would be a chemical change. Mm -hmm.